designing an Australia, Australian garden. Um, before we begin, I'd just like to acknowledge that this bookshop sits on the land of the Wurundjeri people, and to that end, I'd like to extend my respect to their ancestor and el ancestors and elders, past and present. Um, I'm joined tonight by um, two fantastic uh, Australian garden designers, Fiona Brockhoff and Kate Cullody, who I'm sure you all know. Um, nevertheless, I'll, I'll jump through the formalities. Fiona is, a, is an Australian garden designer and author of the recent book, With Nature, which of course we have here tonight for sale, being a bookshop. Um, and you will get $5 off um, as well if you buy one tonight, assuming you don't already have it. Um, her own garden, created on the windswept sand dune on Victoria's Mornington Peninsula, has been profiled all over the world and is widely regarded as an iconic contemporary garden. Uh, Fiona's designs draw on rich plant palettes of foliage, colour and form, and champion the use of indigenous plants and local materials used sustainably. Uh, Kate Cullody is a founding director of TCL and is a nationally and internationally recognised published and awarded landscape architect and environmental artist with particular skills in the design of public and private gardens and the integration of public art with landscape and urban design. Oh. <laughs> got furry friends. We've got, got two additional. I don't know if they've got tickets. <laughs> um, TCL, of course, are the, the designers of the Australian Garden um, out at the Botanic Gardens in Cranbourne. Um, tonight is a fairly informal conversation, really, about uh, contemporary Australian garden design and a little bit about the legacy of Australian garden design here. Um, we've got some of um, Kate and Fiona's work just scrolling in the background there. So this is the substance of what we'll be talking about in a really abstract way, but it's going to be a fairly informal um, evening and hopefully we'll have a time, some time for a chat. That's what the space is really good for, actually, a chat with the crowd as well. <coughs> so you guys will be welcome to pop questions later on. Um, to one work out what's what, who's is who. Did you name yours? No, 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 no. It's no, half fun. The, no, no, that's half the fun. Yeah, and well, I don't want to have to go back digging through it all either because there's about 20,000 photos on there. You guys have over delivered. Yeah, well, I wasn't I sure whether that, that was a good thing for you or bad. Yeah, well, we got them all. <laughs> and then I ran out the door. I don't know if we'll get through them all tonight actually because it's on slow setting. But anyway, um, it's a lovely texture for the backdrop. One thing to be aware of, guys, is we are actually um, video recording tonight. So the camera's there, it's facing the stage, but if you don't want to be recorded, then keep your face away from that iPad at the back. Um, all right, well, we may as well kick things off. Thanks for coming again, guys, and thanks for joining us from Adelaide, Kate. That's thank it. you for having us. Yeah, thanks for inviting yeah. me. Pleasure to have you here in this little space. Yeah, it's divine, with uh, that great plant. <laughs> yes, I know. We were just talking about how we might, I might have to get a bit ruthless at some point. It's taking over. There's no room for books anymore. <laughs> um, Fiona, I, um, I was looking through your book again today and the one thing that struck me about it actually the second time around, which hadn't occurred to me the first time around, is it's, it's, a, story, it's, a, it's a story about you in lots of ways as well as your mm -hmm. garden design. So mm -hmm. it's not a conventional kind of collection of coffee table book style projects. Mm -hmm. It's actually full of lots of personal reflections, um, which I really enjoyed. Thank um, you. And it begins with a really good question, which I think is a great way of starting this conversation, which is why garden? What, what drew you both to gardening in a way? And I guess the, fault, the corollary to that is sort of what is a garden, which is something that we've been talking a little yeah. bit about as well, Kate. There's two good questions there. Two questions, <laughs> two big questions. <laughs> I think, um, I mean, for me, I grew up in a, a family of of gardeners. Um, Dad used to look after his lawn like it was a bowling green and Mum was more interested in architecture and architectural sort of style um, gardens. So we had a, we grew up in a 50, late 50s house, so a modernist house. And so for, for me that was, you know, it, it was sort of part of what, what we did and what we were interested in. And we also didn't have a television. So um, because that uh, Mum thought it stopped children from being creative, which I think is probably quite right. So we spent a lot of time out, outdoors um, building cubbies and you know, the garden wasn't sacred. So for me it was definitely about immersion and, um, and then with time I worked out that I could put my love of art and being creative together with the plants, which I'd already sort of had an affinity to with. So um, yeah, for me it was sort of I think I was really lucky just to sort of fall into that um, realm of, of becoming a garden designer and, and it was through beginning with horticulture. Um, but I think, you know, for a lot of people, why garden? It's, um, 
it's so important on so many levels, isn't it? It can, it can be about um, food production and, you know, growing things for the table. It can be for mental health reasons. And for, you, for those of you that garden, I think, you know, you would understand that spending a day tending plants and getting hands dirty and actually sort of changing something in that outdoor realm can be enormously satisfying. And I think, um, I, I find at least that it, it can take my mind off other things. It can be a distraction and a sort of a help. You're outside and you're in the sunshine and, um, and, and you're working with um, the soil. And I think, you know, for, for, I mean, Kate um, designs gardens in probably more public spaces as a landscape architect. You know, not everyone has that opportunity to garden at home. So you're creating um, spaces for, for people to get out of their own you know, d domestic sort of situation and in, in into, you know, a, a, a bigger place to connect with, with nature. Yeah. Um, so why garden? I mean, it, it's a big question. And there's, it, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons, I think, why, why, we, why we garden. It's interesting that you came to gardening through horticulture and, and mm. am I right that you came to gardening through art? Uh, I came to gardening through my mother, uh, who also was an incredibly keen gardener, and she studied botany, and I actually studied botany at the same university, and there were still some of the same lecturers when I was there. <laughs> and um, which, <laughs> by that time, you got a bit craggy. And uh, so it wasn't... And so I've always made gardens and um, my, my parents lived up, we had, I, I was one of nine children, so we did have quite a big house um, and had a, an amazing garden and it was on the Swan River in Perth and our mum was always in the garden um, and she was always fixing things and she was very practical. Uh, and then she'd get really dolled up at night and she was quite social. But um, uh, she also um, uh, was really, for a, no for a number of generations, my grandfather and my mother were both heavily involved in Kings Park uh, f for a long, long time. So that was a really seminal part of my childhood. So pla plants and my love of plants, like two of my memories of the strongest for me was making a moss garden underneath some tea trees and planting my first plant which was a radish um, um, and when a number of years ago I had to give a talk and I was trying to think well why did I end up in landscape architecture um, it's because I had a boyfriend who was a landscape architect and um, <laughs> he didn't know anything about plants which a lot of landscape architects don't which is embarrassing um, <laughs> Um, and I thought, no, I want to, don't want to be one of those. I want to be a landscape architect who really loves plants. Uh, so I went to Melbourne Uni and studied plants. I studied landscape architecture. And I had an amazing experience when I started to learn plant names. Because you don't learn a lot of plant names in botany. You're kind of doing fungi and mycology mm -hmm. and looking down a microscope, which I loved. I absolutely love looking down the microscope. I love all the patterns and repetition and beauty. Um, but I'm, I'm um, a bit dyslexic and I always had trouble pronouncing all scientific names. And, um, and when I started learning plant names, it was like a penny dropping in my brain. And that was it. Wow. I never and had any trouble pronouncing plant names. Was it the visual anymore. association? Because it was... It was just, I kind of realised that botany was good. I wasn't a very good scientist, but I loved... Uh, plants and just learning about plants in landscape architecture was an incredible. I feel quite emotional, but actually, <laughs> was an incredible experience for me. As was walking the first time I walked into because I was 28. The first time I walked into the design class was an incredible. I just felt like I'd arrived home. I looked at all the people and thought, "This is my tribe." Oh, fantastic! I'm, I'm the complete opposite. I can I can never remember the the Latin names. They just I think we all me. could have done with doing Latin at school. Well, that's one subject I could have I did do it. I was in the um, not-so-good girls class. I the class with mother superior. <laughs> I know I'm more a mess amount. I love, I love it. He loves. That's about it. When, when you were obviously learning your, your practice, um, who did you look to? Were, were there any Australian designers that, that inspired you guys? Or was it all overseas precedents? Um, well, I, I did it 
dissertation or a sort of mini thesis on the restoration of Edna Walling Garden um, as my final fourth year. Um, yeah, that sort of it was the last thing that we did. And so I, I learned a lot about Edna Walling through that process. I knew a lot about her and I looked at a lot of her gardens. Mm. And, and, and she was enormously um, influential and, and still is today. And um, we're actually carrying out a restoration of Edna Walling Garden at the moment, which is... Oh, can I come we, oh wow. Yes, it was the one I wanted to do my thesis on, but couldn't because the owners um, weren't obliging. Um, so definitely Edna Walling. Um, people um, like Gordon Ford and, uh, and Ella Stones um, were really influential. And I think, you know, they, they were all part of that sort of bush gardening um, m movement, which was, you know, it was, it helped us to see the value of the Australian bush and begin to con conserve it. Mm. Um, and then, of course, there was this big movement of, of bush sort of gardening, which um, w was wonderful, except I think a lot of people thought, oh, a bush garden, we just plant it and we walk away. And we'll, <laughs> after sort of, you know, it looks great for five years. And then, you know, over the next five years, things get a little bit out of control and the Tasmanian blue gum, which was, you know, a lovely sort of small sapling, suddenly is becoming a giant. And um, and I think through that process of not understanding that bush gardens needed as much management or different types of management than sort of conventional gardens, native gardens got a bad reputation. And so people, I, I now in my practice, I don't spend a lot of time talking about indigenous and non-indigenous, or I mean, I just talk about plants having a good ecological fit mm -hmm. for the site. Um, and, you know, be, being site appropriate, we know they're gonna grow and they, might, they won't be a problem for the national park n nearby from a self-seeding um, mm -hmm. point of view. So I don't talk about sort of plants coming from here or there necessarily, like we don't talk about you know, I'm going to put a, a Chinese plant there and a Japanese plant there and a, you know, a Western Australian plant there. I talk more about the, the types of plants and, and their appropriateness. Um, and that way you get around that sort of, I don't want a native garden or I do want a native garden. Mm. Sometimes people do actually want to restore a piece of land um, to be habitat and therefore it's, it's totally appropriate to say, okay, what are the plants that are indigenous to this, um, mm. to this area? And so it's often, it's often a combination of, um, of plants. Um, and, and of course, yes, overseas, um, John, John Brooks, who some of you may or may not know, was an English landscape um, designer who um, w was enormously influential. And he, um, did this sort of gardening, I hate calling it gravel gardening, but he used gravel as a mulch and, and a surface in which to plant and negated the need to have sort of dug edges around your garden bed and, you know, lawn running up to it, a dug edge. And that the gravel, often there wasn't a lawn and it was a, maybe a gravel opening and the gravel ran underneath the plants and there was this lovely sort of seamlessness to that. So a sea of gravel disappearing under plants and I looked at that and thought why aren't we doing things like that in Australia I, I studied with him in 1985 for, for five weeks and and so I sort of brought that idea back with me thinking this is so practical and of course uh, and it looks beautiful and then I thought back to a lot of my hiking experiences I think in, in the Australian Alps where you walk along these sort of decomposed gravel paths and indeed that's exactly what's happening on a different continent in a, in a different way so um, yes definitely overseas influences and I think you know not just garden designers and architects but people like Louis Barrigan, who's a um, Mexican architect and, and, and all sorts of other um, people that are involved in art and design and, and, and architecture and, and gardening realms sort of feed into your work if, if you are the sort of person that um, loves that sort of design realm. Mm. Did, did that legacy loom large for you of Ella Stones and Gordon Ford? Um, I suppose because I was brought up in Perth and I spent so much time in Kings Park which had cultivated areas and then had the indigenous open woodland of banksias and, and eucalypts. Um, 
I, I, I had an understanding about cultivating Australian native plants as, a, as often displays and things like that. Uh, but when I started, and, and I think probably the first influence I've ever had was um, I went to the University of WA, which is the most exquisite campus. If anybody's going to Perth, go and have a look at the University of WA. It's, I've been seen university campuses in quite a number of places around the world. It is, it is exceptional. And there was a man called George Munns there, and he created this very beautiful, the Sunken Garden, which was an amphitheatre, which um, I first experienced when I was about four. And it was really seminal of how I wanted to dream about gardens and make gardens. And um, then when I started studying landscape architecture, I was very influenced by Edna Walling and dry stone walling. And I uh, had a small design and construct business and I learned how to do dry stone walling. I loved all of that. And I, I like the, the way in which she um, was more eclectic with plants. And just as Fiona was saying, you know, she w was really imbued with the love of native plants as well as exotic plants. And um, and then I was very influenced really early on in my career. The first project I ever got to work on was um, the Box Hill Community Arts Centre with the architect Greg Burgess. So I was very influenced by Greg's work. And Kevin and I, my belated husband, Kevin Taylor, and I worked on that together. And I was really influenced by the art and crafts movement and Huntavasa. And then um, by Carlo Scarpa, who was an amazing architect, Venetian architect. If you ever go to Venice, it's really worth going and seeing his works. The Olivetti showroom in St. Mark's Square is one of the most exquisite, exquisite interiors. Exquisite. I get very emotional about that as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then um, we were very, I went to Japan in 1998, so very influenced by that. And then Perry joined us, and Perry had studied in Japan. So the sand garden at the Australian Garden is very influenced by Japanese design aesthetics. Mm. That spareness, the mm. idea of um, playing with scale and false perspective, mm. um, and that idea of the Karasansui Garden where it's very respectful and you contemplate the scene rather than being in it. So that. One, that's one of the main reasons why you look at the sand garden when you go mm. to the Australian garden. The other reason is because if you saw people in there, it would mess up the scale. That's right. Um, so and, and therefore the perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. when, you, when you walk in that entrance and you look at that, for those, I'm sure some of you have been to the Cranbourne Botanic Gardens, and if you haven't, you need to go quickly, um, that you don't have a grasp on the scale no. when, when you walk in and, 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 so, and you, you sort of work out how deep the yeah. garden is. Yeah. But well, that was successful. influenced, like the composition of it was influenced by Japanese design mm. principles, but, the, but having it was really influenced also. So Box Hill Community Arts Centre was the first project I worked on with Kevin. And the second one was the Uluru Aboriginal Cultural Centre which are two incredible gifts to be given a young person who knows very mm. little. <laughs> and uh, what a privilege it was to work on that project. And th that project was about um, uh, understanding the, the, uh, the ancient um, and ongoing culture and also really, really observing the landscape and in that project, nothing, nothing was, no plants were added, no trees were removed, very little vegetation, all the paths were sand, the edges to stop people walking into the spinifex were just collected brush from uh, around the park. So um, that idea of landscape as found, you, you just work with what's found mm. and do minimal editing um, compared to, say, Box Hill Community <coughs> Centre, which was, you know, this high key collaborate collaboration is the other huge influence for me. Um, and um, but Box Hill is a very, um, it's an urban setting, yeah. isn't it? Con compared to something that's, you know, con mm. connecting to something mm. much broader 
and spiritual too. Yeah, I mean, and, yeah, and yeah. people and and also um, Maggie Fook was the artist, and she rather than just doing a little bit of ceramics mm. here and there, she just did the whole building, and that wow. was an incredible mm. Mm. experience. Um, and then the other seminal experience for me is was probably working with Kevin. Uh, we have very different skills. And um, and going to art school. Um, I went to art school in about 1999 and uh, studying art history taught me more about landscape than, than studying landscape. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I learned about beauty and the sublime and about the history of landscape and um, do, you, do you think there's a, I mean, you, you've both talked about very international examples as well as obviously that, that Ella Stone's history and, yeah. and what have you. Is there, any, is there any way of sort of describing what we do here in terms of garden practice and garden design as particular to this country, to this place, beyond the notion of you know, what plant where and what's appropriate? Is Actually, there a I cultural forgot, relationship? Yeah, I forgot to mention the project that cemented Kevin and Perry and I together, and that's Royal Park, um, oh. which was the first time that there was more a more poetic, distilled expression of the Australian landscape. Mm. And uh, that individually, we didn't realise we'd all been influenced by it until we got together one day and had a chat. Um, and that, and also the way in which they worked with an artist to do an evocation of what the landscape could be. And that kind of drew us into the whole idea about the poetics of the Australian landscape. Mm. So what, what, could you describe what the key idea was there? Yes, yeah, so Royal Park um, was really about, well, it was about celebrating um, the indigenous landscape. And it was about, it's, um, it was uh, Brian Stafford and Ron Jones from Laceworks. And they really keyed in to the importance of light and air and sky and the ethereal. And almost a sense of immersion as well, I think, which is There's, quite a rare yeah. experience in that urban context. Yeah, so, um, which was, if, if for people who are interested in that kind of thing, if you look at the designs in that competition, there's Ron and and Brian's design. And then there's all these other designs with alleys and avenues and going to the zoo. Bor and, borrowed from Yeah, zoo. and postmodernism. Yeah, yeah. Europe, more European sort of style yeah. of yeah. garden set out. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think, we're, you know, we're starting to see, as I see it, um, more of what Kate's talking about happening in a domestic realm now. And I think you, you'd probably say the same, Amanda, that we're sort of, we're, we're at a point where we're starting to make very Australian gardens for Australian lifestyle and mm. you know with with all of its multiculturalism and um, rather than something that we've we've borrowed from somewhere else because that was our ancestry or we, we were too sort of nervous to go oh we're going to do something Australian you know we, we were borrowing things and, and, and we and we're still borrowing things but I think you know there's a lot of Australian designers now who have got the confidence to make very Australian gardens and use Australian materials too. And, you know, we, I, I try wherever I can to use hard landscape materials in our work that is not coming from India or, you know, that we're, they come from hopefully Victoria and we're lucky because we're geologically blessed. But, you know, it also involves some uh, extraction, but also about recycling um, materials. There was a you know a wonderful example at Mifkus recently where someone had taken a concrete slab and it had all been smashed up and then they rebuilt it into these beautiful retaining walls. Mm. And I just thought, wow, you probably actually. Uh, in fact, I don't think she spent any money on any hard landscape materials. She just repurposed things. And I thought, we need more of that, and we need it done in beautiful ways. So. You know they're sexy and attractive and other people want that sort of look and you know particularly in an urban setting and, and often in a country setting it's you know i think there's a lot of room for that that type of ex expression of um materiality and, and and of course sort of um plants too mm. 
I guess being a more of a public space designer, you, you, you probably don't come across this like I do, but I get a lot of sort of, someone recently saying, I just want a Japanese garden. And I said, <laughs> okay, I said, so, you know, you're, you're living in Sorrento and um, <laughs> if you're after Japanese maples and yeah. Karumi azaleas, and I said, but can we just unpack that for a minute? Yeah. And can you tell me what it is that draws you to that style of garden? And she said, they just make me feel really calm and restful. Mm. I love the simplicity, the greenness, this just like there's very few sort of materials used and that they're used in a way that's not um, formal, even though that there is balance. Um, and I said, so if, if I could design you a garden that um, made you feel like that, but we, we used plants that were from the Mornington Peninsula and, and other site-specific plants with a good ecological fit, would you be happy? And she said, can you do that? And I said, you can. You just you, you just need to know what these plants are capable of. And because a lot of them are happy to be wind sheared and pruned, you know, they're happy to be cloud pruned. Um, and so, you know, Su Susie, Susie got a Japanese garden at, without all of the sort of bamboo um, water featurey bits, <laughs> but she got something that was simple and green and, and restful, and it's sort of a, a Japanese and inspired and authentic. And so, you know, sometimes it's about trying to understand what it is that people really are drawn to, because there's no point me giving you um, one of my style of a, a particular style of garden when actually you want something a bit more crazy and mm. colourful, and, and you want to lose yourself in that sort of craziness. So. You know, I often say to young designers, go to someone's house because you'll understand a lot about their personality. Are they neat? You know, are they colourful? Is it packed full of, you know, crazy things that they've collected or is it more minimal and sort of, you know, monochromatic? But, you know, it, it, it's interesting because everyone's drawn to something different and you have to really um, understand what it is that people love and feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. You, you guys have now both got quite a bit of experience with figuring out what works, obviously, climatically, what works culturally, given mm. the context we're, mm. we're operating mm. in here. What are your biggest mistakes early on that you wish you'd never made? <laughs> are there any? Are there any feet wrong? Um, I think there's, you can always look at things and say, I could have done that better or a little bit differently with, with the information that you have now. So, you know, it's easy to be critical in, in retrospect, isn't it? Um, probably the hugest thing I learned was that, the, I think it was the second garden I did, I marked all of the trees to be kept and the arborist came and took them all out. Oh, oh no. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Thinking, you know, it, it's sort of hard to get it wrong, isn't it? Like you've got one beautiful big Japanese maple that fills half the back garden and you've got three dead trees around it. Oh and God. he'd actually sent an apprentice. So that was a mistake that I actually hadn't made sure that I was there when the trees were being pulled up. But um, I think, you know, with time you become more confident because you become more and you become more experienced. And so... Um, things start to loosen up in the, in the way that you design and, and you become bolder and a little bit more adventurous. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, I think too, once you've got gardens that are established and you can take potential clients to them and, and, and get their reaction and, and, and watch people in those garden spaces that you've created and, and, and learn from that what are the things that really sort of excite people or, or really connect them to the landscape very strongly. You know, you, you, you learn a lot to take in on, on the rest of your journey in, in, in the landscape design sense. So, um, yes, I mean, I can't think of specific mistakes, but there's some things I look at and think, wow. <laughs> like, I don't look at because I never drive. <laughs> I've never got that street. I bumped into someone at the market recently and she's saying, hello, it's me. And I'm like looking at her thinking, she goes, it's Lisa, you did that garden for us ages ago. And I was just thinking, I remember that garden. It was really... You've managed to forget her. I managed to forget her <laughs> and her garden. And I was sort of, I remember her saying, no, I don't want anything too fancy and I don't want anything too adventurous. And, and you start going, 
Oh, if I just put a few plants here and there, and I hardly had any experience. And, and you know, I think it was, when I, when I think back, I think, was it just like some plants around the edge of the garden? <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't even begin to think of it. It's like um, that old saw, isn't it? It's like, if you're a doctor, you can bury your mistakes. If you're an architect, it's there. If you're a landscape yeah. architect or a garden designer, it just grows bigger and bigger. That's right. Yeah, it just hopefully <laughs> doesn't get pruned and it's all, it's all, it's all hidden. Yeah. yeah. Kate, another way of framing this question might be to say, would, are there projects that worked then that might not work now because of the way, or that, that you might not yeah, do I quite the that, same way? Yeah. Mm. Um, um, well, that whole thing of timely and timelessness, you know, mm. and sometimes getting that recipe isn't always quite right. Um, because you, you know you can get cajoled and seduced by whatever's the sparkliest thing in fashion at the moment, or whatever. In terms of you know, like um, like at the moment, it's perennial gardens, and um, uh, a lot of the staff wanting to do perennial gardens, and I'm saying they take a lot of care. They take a lot of care. And spe specialised maintenance. Specialised maintenance. Like somebody showed me a picture today, mm -hmm. and I said, "Well, you got to cut that back, and you've got to, <laughs> you've got to uh, do that. So that, stake one, that and you've got to stake that. that, and that one's yes. got sap. So you've got to know." Yeah. And um, so um, that I, we would do differently. I think you know you often may do things differently. Um, I think if you take people along on the journey and you go on a journey of inquiry and not knowing, um, I think we're, we might have made some mistakes is trying to, because our work can be quite eclectic, of, try, of really early on, I remember you know something that worked really well at Box Hill, very colourful, the ceramics and and the the flower and the colours of the vegetation that kind of were in conversation with that. And then I remember at one project, it, it wasn't authentic to do something like that. So I learnt that pretty early. Mm. Mm. Um, I think now it's about. Um, I just really spend a lot of time banging on about maintenance and care at the moment. And um, so because that, that is what's going to stop me doing public projects into the future mm. and, um, like, and, and makes me want to work harder and harder at taking the client on the journey so that they understand the progression of the mm, garden. Mm. So we provide the clients, for the public clients and, and private clients, with um, a, a little booklet about how to care for the garden and what the, it's got the design concept in it, yep. concept in it. Yep, that's and a great then, idea. And it's got each plant and what you've got to do. Because I'm really surprised even wealthy private clients that we've had, I've, I've sort of presented them with great gardeners and they've gone, oh, they're too, they cost too much. And I'm thinking, but that's what it's going to take. <laughs> that's um, right. And yeah. so I just really want to create my own garden again now so that I can care for it. Um, <laughs> and because uh, uh, I had a big garden, now I've got a little garden and I want another a garden. Um, so care is, care is such a huge mm. topic. Mm. And I think the word care... I prefer to maintenance because yes. maintenance is very perfunctory, whereas well, it alludes a, to keeping something in a sort of yeah, almost status, cares and status embrace. state. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, <clears throat> um, about ten years ago now, Leon Van Schaik came to our office and convinced Kevin Perry and I to do a PhD, and. He, he got us across the line about convincing us by saying, you'll find out what you've really been on about and that'll help you go to the next thing or the next exploration of your work. And I was always really a bit concerned that I privileged beauty over sustainability. So I interrogated that and realised that the conduit between beauty and sustainability is care. And just been noticing in the last five years, it's something that's talked a lot about in social sciences, in literature, 
it's some and the care of the planet and the care of one another. That's right. And I think it's for me the care it's and a thing choices. I'm very yeah. Um, I think I could say I'm nearly becoming obsessive about it <laughs> in terms of gardens. Well, you take the carer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> did you, did I you used to be a cupcake, so maybe. All right. <laughs> oh, that's, I, think, I, I mean, we, we find that really challenging, finding people. Yeah. If, if the client isn't able to be involved in the yeah, care and maintenance. Yeah, when they do it. Yeah. yeah. But they want to outsource it. I meet with that mm. carer, mm. gardener, mm. Um, often a few times a year or at least I keep those communication lines mm. open and say if something's not going well let or go. that tree's yeah. died in the corner for whatever reason let's talk about it before you maybe go and make a choice about replacing it but you know it's it's all very well to say you know that row of plants is going to be a hedge but unless that's communicated to the carer it could easily just become a big bank of vegetation. And so at Burnley, they used to say, gardens are only as good as the care and maintenance mm. that they receive. And, and it's sort of, it's so, it's so true, isn't it? And you really want your clients, um, particularly if they're private clients, to, to be involved in the evolution of their garden and the process of mm. gardening. You know, gar gardening is a process and not a product. It's not like a house and it's built and then you, you maintain it by maybe painting it and cleaning it. But, you know, the, the garden evolves and it changes and you need to understand the, the designer's in, intent in that way. So, yeah. you know, it, it's a very different, different thing. And I think too, if, you, if your garden's quite, my garden, um, it, it changes because things self-sow in the gravel and then I go, wow, that's an interesting plant to have wet there. And so it's sort of, could do it on this on this personal level but if someone else came in they'd be going oh, shit i don't know like it's it, mm. this this plants come up would, would i leave it or take it out or so yeah. you know it, it, it it's it's a very personal garden for for that for that reason and would be harder to communicate the, that process of caring for a garden like that to to somebody else yeah, I love Julian Raxworthy's idea of the veridic, this idea of the garden growing over time in that book of his, which is unfortunately out of print now. Guys, I don't, I'd love to sell you a copy because it's a brilliant book um, that captures all of these historical mm. gardens That's through time. That's fascinating when at, at the conference mm. he went through that. Um, mm. the, the project of ours that I love going back to is the Forest Gallery in the Melbourne Museum. And uh, that's a, um, a product of um, ongoing care with the curators and the gardeners for 20 years now, Perry and Paul, particularly Paul Thompson, have been going back every year and talking to them. Yeah. And I always just love going in there. Unfortunately, they've just changed that system. I don't think Paul's going back um, now. I, I don't know whether it's cuts or whatever, but it was just you know, having that ongoing dialogue yeah. that you were talking about, which is mm -hmm. so so important mm -hmm. and um we also you probably like to select the to suggest the gardeners we we we, we, we yeah. do because y yeah, you I come like to learn that. who's yeah. you know uh, yeah. ordered it and yeah. who's like doing it for money or you know and who, who yeah. doesn't really care it's sort of a job um, mm -hmm. i think often what we find is that really good gardeners um they often aspire to becoming something else, like a garden designer. Yeah. Oh, I might just leave the realm of garden care. And you're like, no, 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 no you so good at that. I've been actually it's teaching such a you great... a lot of things and, you know, grooming you to, to do this job. You can't go and become a landscape designer. That would just be terrible. And you wouldn't be any good at it anyway. Um, so, you know, it's hard, it's hard to find good um, care and maintenance people. And, you know, they're... they're they're just not very common and so you really you know yeah. I, i'm very protective of them when yes. someone says have you got someone i go oh, I know. yes yeah. but i'm no. pretty sure that they're full they're down <laughs> they work I'm for very me sorry but yeah. if, they, if an opening comes up yeah, looming, I behind, <laughs> looming behind that question I, I guess in a way is this particularly the issue around sustainability is obviously climate change have, have you guys seen things change in such a way that guns you would have designed 20, 30 years ago would no longer work or at least you don't um, believe would work in 10, 20 years time? It's hard when you just come out of a like sort of La Nina and it's been 
terribly wet for three years and yeah. plants have been literally Thriving. drowning. Oh, drowning. Yeah, not, not dying mm. from, from, from drought. You, you sort of begin to forget, don't you? I mean, I, you know, I remember like the 83 drought and all the silver birches in Melbourne died really because they're, they're shallow rooted and they're, and they're not really suited to our climate. In the last sort of three years, we've seen them uh, grow ferociously. So, um, well, I think we're, we're all becoming better at plant selection because it's so in, important to get that ecological fit right. So um, we're sort of doing it naturally without thinking. I mean, yes, we are thinking about climate change and it's very important to consider that because I think in this day and age, designing gardens that require a lot of artificial irrigation, it, it, it's, it's just not on and it's not, it's not generally accepted. There's still, of course, garden designers out there designing sort of high maintenance, high water requirement gardens. But, you know, I, th I think with time, we're going to find that those people fall out of fashion because it's just, it's not practical and it's not... Uh, an acceptable use of valuable natural resources um, and you know you, you can do so many beautiful things with plants that are suited to your site you know whether they're from the desert soil plants or you know there's so many plants to choose from that are actually grown and available in, in this day and age so um, yeah I, th I think because we've only been designing gardens maybe for you know 35 or whatever, whatever years it, there's been a big change but it's not really really noticeable mm -hmm. is there more demand generally at the moment for kind of xeriscapes and less well, I think people are really um, I think perennial gardens and also um, you know th there's a uh, Mediterranean Gardens and the Mediterranean Gardens Society is becoming really pronounced and um, and for the right reasons. I think yeah. um, <clears throat> I, I was lucky. I worked on the Mediterranean Garden at the Botanic Gardens in Adelaide quite a while, 15 years ago, and I just learned so much about climate type compatibility from because I grew up in Perth, which is Mediterranean, and living in mm, Adelaide, mm. which is another Mediterranean climate type um, area. There's five in the world. Um, and uh, the whole understanding about, um, about at plant adaptations, which is something I kind of was really interested in when I studied botany. But I think people are really understanding that, as you were saying, you can have a certain sensibility that that gives the essence and the authenticity without mimicking being somewhere else. And that whole idea, um, um, I was so pleased when I found this quote from George Seddon, who is a, an incredible mm. academic and polymath, and he said, um, we Australians need to, um, we need to forgive Australia for not being England. And I think we are coming around to that. <coughs> Finally. Finally. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, that, and the whole thing of um, creating microclimates. Um, and um, that's the other thing I'm kind of really interested in at the moment are microclimates and how buildings create microclimates. Mm. And when we've been asked to do high rise um, buildings, because I, I think I have made an odd, odd mistake about that, although it's incredibly difficult to predict everything when you're up in the air because the minute you go up the wind is horrendous mm -hmm. and everything's in planters and <laughs> the architects over the process of the of the project give you less and less soil <laughs> yeah. and you uh, ask for 607 for, I know, for I about six. for a meat 1.2 <laughs> <laughs> <And I think laughs> about balustrade with trees. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 up with for trees <laughs> um, but but it's hard to predict what the microclimates are so we spend quite a lot of time now staring at wind stu at, at sun studies and then selecting the plants you don't so much need to do it in a, we don't, I don't do it so much in a residential situation, but also the microclimate that a big concrete building, a house creates as, as well. Mm. But, mm. And then how plants can create another type of microclimate. Mm. Mm. I really love the fact that in your book you had a section on light. I just think light, the chiaroscura of light and yeah. shadow is one of the most 
delicious and important ingredients yeah. in and the garden. Light, light's sort of everything, isn't it? The yeah. way that it, you know, hits a tree and, and the light bounces off or, yeah. you know, the way something might be uplit artificially or the play of light on, on water and how you can look at a, the same piece of ocean every day but every day is completely different. Mm because of the light and, 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 and the wind that plays on that surface. So, yeah, I think it's really important and it, it's often not sort of thought about, isn't it? Sometimes just the play of light on something, you know, on, on a wall, it doesn't have to have a painting to be interesting, mm. but to have the play of light on that wall can be a, a fascinating thing. And, mm. and, yeah, I think it's, um, it's never thought about enough. Is it? It's a bit like lighting in a house. Often people just go and put a whole lot of down rows of down lights, but you know they don't think about reading by maybe a lamp in the corner or that you know or up lighting. Yeah, you know, it's often down lighting that you know makes you look twice as old. Ghoul, <laughs> yeah, I actually was <laughs> ghoulish. Ghoulish. <laughs> well, we'll be talking more about light because evidently as you get older. You spend a lot of time talking about light. <laughs> because, you know, you go and you go, oh, isn't that beautiful light today? And you do that as you get to your senior years. Well, sort of the, the walking towards the light. The it's weather. Getting, you talk about closer. the weather and the particularly light for some reason. <laughs> and, 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 you met, yeah, and your health yeah. challenges. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, in our street, we've got this thing called the organ recital. Everybody knows one another in the street. You're allowed to talk about your health for one minute. That's it. That be organ recital for a minute and then you've got to shut up. <laughs> I love it. It's yeah, good. good. That's yeah. the end of my questions, guys. So I think it's probably a good time for me to throw it out to the crowd if anybody would like to, to pop a question. You've got two of Australia's best garden designers right here. So, free consult. <laughs> <laughs> bring, out, bring out your photos. <laughs> Thank you for this lovely discussion in the book, which I'm lucky enough to have looked through last month. Um, in a lot of the images and in the book, I think a lot of it, there is very few straight lines, actually. Uh, it's, I don't know if that's deliberate or subconscious, but it, that, that to me just really struck me, being an architect, seeing the way that every edge seems to be deliberately curved or angled or it, 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 it's generally deliberate. Sometimes there are straight lines that maybe pick up the architecture. Um, in, in, our, in our own house, we have limestone feature walls that run through the house like a spine and then, um, and then into the garden and they sort of anchor the garden and they provide shelter, but they also connect the house very strongly with the landscape. Those straight lines are often then softened by a mantle of planting that sort of falls over them. And so, you know, you, you indeed might have some straight lines, but you don't always notice them because they're broken by um, planting. But I think, um, it, and it depends where you're designing because probably more of the urban gardens have more straight lines and, and it's harder to move away from them. Um, John Brooks always talked about um, when you're designing, you have definitive curves don't have curves that wander all over the place. Like, and, and think about the alphabet. You know, when when you're when you're when you're actually planning a garden and using letters of the alphabet. So, I, I got into definitive curves um, and 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 circles and spheres and things. I think quite early early on. But I, th you know, I think it, it's often important to include those lines, particularly if you've got some you know strong architecture or you want to connect that architecture very. Um, Strongly with the with the garden, um, you don't have lots of straight lines, but there's obviously oh, projects where where there we are. Do, we we do like a good stripe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, North Terrace is all lines. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I was just trying to think of, um, and often the hardscape parts are lines. Actually, strangely, at the Australian Garden, if you look at the aerial. Um, uh, um, it's actually got these or what we call ordering marks through it that mm. go from mm. one side that go from east to west and then they're broken in the middle with the sand garden and um, they um, 
they, 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 they are straight lines, and I don't but mind don't, a straight line, but it's kind of no, them as, no, that as a visitor kind of moving the, yeah. through through that landscape. But you definitely, you know, it's, you always notice something different from a, from a plan mm. point, an aerial point of view, don't you? Mm. You know, and and I was working on a project with some architects this morning, and and he was, you know, sort of we were talking about these curves, and I said, do you know, in the end, my straight lines will be broken by these rounded things called mm. plants and you don't need to put the curves in because the plants mm. will do it for you. Let's take the form of the architecture out into the garden and then plot plants all over it and, and we'll get everything that we need. You know, the, the round sort of curvy beautiful balls and and the straight and the straight lines that are sort of broken. So Maybe um, it's more about the juxtaposition really of mm. when something's right like a when something's suggesting a, a curve or a, or a straight mm. line, or a, I think maybe it, it maybe rather than straight lines and curves, for us it's more about um, um, often repetition um, um, or, or patterning mm. um, or rhythm um, mm. or ordering systems. I had a real breakthrough in all of that when um, mm. I was re re reading um, um, about biophilia but still wanted to kind of get more of a sense, like um, the person who coined the word biophilia, um, E.O. Wilson, talks about us humans having innate ability to be drawn to nature and, um, and um, I thought well, that's and then and then there's this other guy. I think it was Gregory Bateson. I'm not exactly sure now, but anyway, he he talked about how um, we're drawn to nature because we actually are we are nature. We are composed of systems, mm. and that humans are drawn to patterns and repetition and rhythm and mathematical. Um, systems and as a way of making sense of the world because we are made of all of those things and by looking out and seeing rhythms and patterns and repetition um, it, it we can decode the world and mm. for me it was kind of like a penny dropping mm. that's why we are so drawn to nature not just because we're part of it because we are part of all of these systems that are composed mm. in these myriad of different scales mm. of the micro to the macro. Because at some point we started thinking of ourselves as not being part of nature, didn't mm. we? So, sort of like nature's there and we're here. And, you know, and, and, and I think that sort of makes, makes sense of it. Like we, we are part of nature and, and that's why that actually... We, that's we, why we, we can, draw Why we connect, why yeah. we connect to that. He called it a gene, a, a gene evolution th thing that we're genetically wired mm. to seek out patterns and ordering systems mm. and repetition mm. and rhythm. And I kind of mm. thought, well, that rings true for me. Mm. <laughs> I don't know if I like that my one. gardens are big enough to have lots of lovely <laughs> rhythms, but you know, yeah, but it's all do. about you, scale. You, you often it? have repetition in yeah, your work, which right. is really, um, yeah. which I'm really drawn to. Mm. That. Mm. It's not a sp there's not a spottiness going on. There's mm. a beautiful composition and then an accent mm. and mm. and then um, a flow and, and a rhythm. It's about reusing things too, isn't it? And that, mm. can, and that can be from in you know interior to exterior and and all, all throughout the garden. Mm. You know, you, you, the use of the same materials or mm. or the same pattern with different materials. Mm. You know, depending on where where you are. I think we might have time for. One more question, if anybody's feeling brave. Maybe two. Mm -hmm. um, me? Yeah, that's <laughs> yes, you. <laughs> I'm um, asking a question. Um, so, uh, with garden design, like when you first start, there is a picture in your mind, once you've got all the information from the client and, and mm. you're going towards a direction. Mm. Because gardens evolve over many, many years, mm. at what sort of point do you have like several visions throughout, like oh, it's going to be like this in two years and five years and ten years and twenty years and thirty years? Or what sort of, like do you have an 
age process or is it like you've got the structure of the bones of the garden that will always remain and that's a really interesting mm. question because I don't know if I think about it all that much I, I often think about the sort of hard landscape and how that goes together like how it actually works from a level perspective and you know what is it that you're trying to block or in, in draw into the garden you know in terms of sort of you know the, the parameters um and and all of the components that you know that are part of the brief you know the water feature or a shaded spot to you know sit and sit and eat so thinking about all of those things and and i guess you are thinking about the vegetation at a certain certain type at with certain heights and so then it's about trying to sort of find the plants to put to fulfill that picture or, or that vision so if you're thinking you know i need a seven meter tree to soften that block of a block of apartments what what would that be um so i think you're thinking about it generally as an end result mm -hmm. um but it's also thinking about the actual hard landscape as well and, and how that sort of works to, to, to bring everything together into something that's, you know, aesthetically beautiful and, 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 and functional and, you know, fits the budget. Mm. Do you think of it as an end, like, in, um, in increments or is it sort of... I, I probably the same as you, but sort of think when we're kind of doing the hardscape and then the planting, mm -hmm. um, think of it more as a dream into it and imagine what it will be like. Mm. Um, and what it and feels then, like to be in there. Yeah, mm. and then, um, you know, whether you have any um, short term plants, short term trees, um, uh, like at the Gondwana Garden in the Australian garden. There's a whole lot of wattles to create mm. a microclimate so that other shady things could, could grow and then mm. they're, they're taken out and, and then there's another garden that, um, that was on the screen where um, there, there was really quick screening needed to happen so they um, put that Mayapur and Beitia in. Mm. But it'll, it only lasts for five years. Mm. It'll last longer if it gets absolutely no water, which is getting in that spot. But then there's some other plants that are gonna grow and be the, the permanent screen. Mm. But one of the problems we have is um, the contractors giving things too much water and then they really bolt. And yeah. um, uh, that's a bit of a problem. That can be a big problem. There's a lot of, you know, J James Hitchmore, for example, is doing a lot of work where they're actually making the soil pour. Mm. You know, this is on this is on large scale plantings, mm. not not so much in sort of domestic situations or, or, or people's own gardens, and and so that gives all of the different plants an opportunity to come up together rather than letting the bolters mm. bolt. You know, so it's actually reducing the nutrient status. Oh, it sounds bizarre, doesn't it? Like. Get the nutrition out of your garden, like and then you know, no the opposite water. of giving it blood and bone and water. Uh, yeah. You're sort of like actually putting a layer of something that has very low nutritional value, and so every plant has to work hard to, to come up, and it helps the plants come up together rather than some coming up quickly and outshading the the others and and growing at the expense of you know all, all of all of the different people mm. in the room mm. um so yeah it's an interesting it's an interesting thing um to to think about they talked about that quite a lot at the conference and yeah we had a question over here um i really loved edward Curtis's book on biophilia and affiliation with nature but um I've always, I've, we were talking about today actually about the use of renders and how we're sort of becoming disconnected with our natural world mm. through technology and everything like that. But I'm sort of thinking more about with rendering systems and especially maybe more so with TCL and how do you sort of go about working with projects where a picture sort of derived giving like a, a 
an idea that it doesn't actually look like that sometimes? That's and a really good question. Yeah. Like, I, don't, I don't like it when the staff just put dolly models in it everywhere. I like some old people. And they're these two yeah. old blokes. One guy's got a fair old job program. I don't like putting him in everything. <laughs> they're, they're like Wally. Where's Wally? But um, so um, uh, that's a good question. Um, Actually, I have been one of our projects where it was more on steroids with a juggler doing something and things happening here and things happening there than we had in the render, so that was good. <laughs> but um, I, I really like those kind of... I prefer renders that are maybe um, are not realistic, yeah. that you mm. have the ability to dream, that the person looking at it has the ability to dream and put themselves in it. So... Mm. Um, often um, not, you know, the people are a bit ghosted um, so that um, it's an evocation, it's not a, it's not completely realistic. We look using Lumion a lot at the moment and I really don't like it. I hate the way the people kind of are really stiff. It's also really racist. That's right. And it's also really, um, uh, what's the other thing about it is, they kind of like if you if because we were working in Darwin and um, we wanted um, some Aboriginal people yeah. in there, but if you've got dark skin in Lumion, you've either got a baseball bat off, or you're a woman with very little clothes and a lot of breasts and bottom showing. It's really disgusting. <laughs> I don't, I really I, Lumion's great for. You know, for, well, it's good for doing 3D when it's mm. complex, but actually I, don't, I really just don't like the look of it mm. at all. I think the, um, the ghosting thing's a great idea, isn't it? Because it gives you a sense of scale of a person in the landscape. Yeah. But, or you put the person at the front really big, um, so you know that it's, a, it's not real. I, I prefer making them people dream into them and can mm. see all the elements but mm. I, I think it's a real pity we don't make models anymore we used to make hand models and clients mm. love models mm. because they can they, they 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 can hold them they can see the crafting mm. and I used to do watercolors a lot they really love watercolors the other thing that we do a lot is um, we get those marker pens and Perry's fantastic at it and color it color in trace mm. Mm. And, mm. and they go all water, they're like watercolours mm. and you can kind of mm. mix them mm. together and they have that immediacy mm. and our clients really love all of those things where they can see the human hand. That's mm. right, rather than vector works or CAD. Or, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, they're all good. very valuable, all of those all things. All of those I like are really valuable. You need yeah, to working have them all in 3D. To, to, to but, yeah. I wonder if... It struck me that th those tools, particularly the animation tools, could show a landscape through time quite well. Yeah, they, yeah. Is that something that you've lent on much? I mean, it might help with that idea of maintenance mm. as well, just mm. telling that story. And then this is what it's going to be like at yeah. the beginning. With the right We haven't done that, but <laughs> yeah. it, would, it would be a good thing and to do. the wrong maintenance. We're often asked what something's going to be like in the first, say, in four years' time, in five years' time, and we've done a series of sections, but I... But um, probably there has been, but I haven't worked on a project where you show all of all of those um, as a whole composition. But we're often asked those questions mm. and having to show what size the tree is going to be and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Point the maintenance team at it. In ten years' time, you don't cut this down. <laughs> well, I keep going. No, we're not. No, we're not putting a plant on that car park wall because nobody's going to look after it. No, we're not putting a planter over there because the person in the hospital is just going to be looking out at some mulch. Like, I spend the and whole time and a dead plant because you can't yeah. get out there. Yeah. I spend my whole time at work going, no, no, we're not putting a plant there. Yeah. We're, we're, because I know how much, you know, even if you have bad, you know, you do the bad soil thing and no watering, mm. Mm. it's an artificial situation mm. and, yeah. Well, very no is unfortunately not a very good way of ending. Uh, sorry, no, that was <laughs> we've, we've run out of time. You say yes. 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 Sorry about yes. that, yes. folks. <laughs> Please join me in thanking our speakers tonight, Fiona and Kate. Thank you very much. We do have books available.